So our next speaker then is uh, is Emma Durden. Uh, uh, Duerden, I think actually I mispronounced that. Uh, my apologies, Emma. Uh, so uh, Dr. Duerden is an assistant professor in applied psychology in the Faculty of um, Education at Western University. Uh, she completed her doctoral degree in neuroscience at the University of Montreal before completing a postdoctoral fellowship in developmental pediatrics at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Uh, her research focus is on identifying biomarkers that underlie variations in functional outcomes in infants and children who are at high risk for neurodevelopmental disorders. So welcome, Emma. Great. Thanks very much, Ron. And thank you very much for inviting me to present today. So up to 85% of children with autism spectrum disorder or ASD have symptoms of anxiety. And as Beth Kelly noted in her talk, this is an important mental health issue. And our group over the last couple of years has conducted a series of studies examining the role of deep brain structures and their involvement in the generation of anxiety behaviors in children and adolescents with ASD. And the overall goal of this research is to better understand the mechanisms underlying anxiety behaviors, as well as to identify markers in the brain that could later be used to assess the efficacy of treatments for anxiety in children and adolescents with ASD. So today during my talk, I'm first going to focus on the types of anxiety seen in children and adolescents with ASD. I'm then going to discuss this in relation to understanding the development of deep brain structures, particularly the amygdala, a brain region involved broadly in emotional responses. And then I'll link it together in terms of how we can study alterations in brain development and related to anxiety behaviors in children and adolescents with ASD. So as mentioned previously, ASD is a complex neurodevelopmental disorder occurring in 1.5% of the general child population. It is more common in boys than in girls, as mentioned previously today. And the core diagnostic features include social communication difficulties, as well as restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior. Today during my talk, I'll be focusing more on social communication impairments as it relates to anxiety behaviors. So these types of impairments include reduced eye contact, so the uh, averted gaze during um, conversation, also limited social interactions, and difficulties with identifying emotions in others. And in turn, these factors that can uh, impact reciprocal social interaction can in turn heighten anxiety in individuals on the spectrum. Additionally, some children and adolescents with ASD can also have an altered pitch or speak in a monotone voice. And in turn, it can be very difficult to identify anxiety in these individuals as we often can only perceive anxiety, anxious, someone being anxious by the tone of their voice. So in turn, while only 6% of the general child population experiences anxiety, nearly 40% of children with ASD have a diagnosed anxiety disorder. And these disorders include phobias, OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder, and social anxiety disorder or SAD. So a big question remains is, why is it that children with autism and ADHD and children and adolescents have a greater incidence of anxiety compared to typically developing children? So of course, there is the association of with social skills, impaired social skills, and there's an association with heightened anxiety symptoms. And certainly disentangling the two becomes very complex. However, recent research from brain imaging studies have really highlighted the role of atypical brain development in these processes. And a hallmark feature of children with autism spectrum disorder is altered development of brain regions broadly involved in emotional processing. And at its core is a brain region known as the amygdala located deep within the medial temporal lobes. And if we were to cut through the brain here, we would see the amygdala here on either side, inside the temporal lobes. 
And the amygdala, while a very small structure, is taking information from sensory information. So this can be visual information, touch information, taking information about thoughts and translating it into an emotional response. So this has been studied extensively in response to fearful stimuli. So let's say you're afraid of snakes, as many people are. And so you see a snake and this information is going to go to your visual cortex to the brain part of the brain that's responsible for processing vision and then the information will eventually go to the amygdala which is going to have downstream sign signaling so when you see the snake you're going to have increased heart rate your autonomic system is being activated your uh, pupils could dilate you want to activate the motor response system so you can run away we also have the activation of the body stress response system release of cortisol the body stress hormone and turn so these factors can contribute to the feelings of anxiety which of course is a psychological physiological and behavioral response to a perceived or actual threat Evidence from brain imaging studies have highlighted a role in, for the amygdala in processing anxiety. And this was an older study which examined a group of school-aged children with ASD. They were about seven to, and to eight years old. And they had the children undergo MRI scans. And they studied the volumes, the size of the amygdala by studying the brain volumes. And that is what is being demonstrated here in the graphs on the left and on the right. On the y-axis are the amygdala volumes, and on the x-axis are the anxiety scores. This is a parent report-based measure called the Child Behavior Checklist. It's a standardized test that's used to assess behavior in typically and atypically developing children. Overall, what the researchers found, particularly for the right amygdala, we see that larger volumes are associated with higher scores on the CBCL, so increased anxiety behaviors. And just to note, I'll pause here, that when we're looking at changes in the brain from MRI, this is reflecting changes in neurons and other cell types in the brain. So we have, for example, the cell bodies here of the neurons, and they communicate with one another by these different processes here. And so we often think of the brain like a muscle and that bigger is better. However, what we see that oftentimes bigger can actually mean that we have neurons, they are closely clustered together, and this can represent difficulties with signaling and communicating with one another while well, sometimes for brain regions having a smaller volume can represent more efficient processing. So in turn, when we see larger volumes, this could represent an increased density in neuronal size or number and a reflection of the connectivity between those neurons, how they're communicating with one another. So in turn, this, this previous study examining brain-based correlates showed this association between larger amygdala volumes and anxiety behaviors in children with ASD. Now, an important point to note is that the amygdala, while it's a very small structure, it's actually very complex in terms of its different subcomponents. And if we were to cut through the amygdala, we would see inside, as shown here, and we would see that it has many different types of cells and these are clustering together. And these are known as nuclei. And there's a focus on my talk today on two main nuclei, which represent the main input and output nuclei. So for the main input nucleus, this is the basal lateral amygdala representing this nuclear group here. It's receiving information from many parts of the brain that are involved in processing emotion, memory, sensory information. And it's sending this information to the central nucleus, which is a key output nucleus of the amygdala. And the, this central nucleus, while a very tiny, small nucleus, is crucial for that downstream signaling that I mentioned previously for those behavioral and physiological responses, which attribute to anxiety. Which are, uh, which are attributed to increased sensations of anxiety. 
So in turn, more recent research with advances in MRI and analytic methods, more recent research has turned to examine the role of these subcortical structures in the amygdala and their association with anxiety behaviors. This is a study that was done just a couple of years ago in which they examined the volumes of the input and output nuclei of the amygdala in relation to anxiety behaviors. And this was done in a sample of children, of, of children that did not have ASD. So this was in a sample of, of typically developing children with anxiety. So in turn, what they found was they plotted the data from the volumes in relation to the anxiety scores, which are shown here on the x-axis. And they found that children with larger volumes of the basolateral amygdala, the main input nucleus, had increased anxiety behaviors. They noticed trends with the central nucleus, the main output nucleus, but this was not significant. So overall, this study demonstrated that the subnuclei play an important role in anxiety and anxiety behaviors in children. So in turn, we first wanted to examine the development of these deep brain structures, these subcortical nuclei, in a group of children with ASD who were scanned twice as part of a longitudinal brain imaging study. The children, this included a group of just under 40 children, and the children were scanned with MRI um, at around 12 years of age, and they returned again for a second scan at the two to three years later at around the age of uh, 15. This was a sample of 23 children with ASD and 15 typically developing children. The children with ASD underwent diagnostic assessments, and this included the Autism Diagnostic Interview, or the ADIR, and the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, or the ADOS. And this, while we did not have measures of anxiety in this cohort, we did have, we were able to look at the subscales of the uh, ADIR in relation to social communication impairments to examine this in relation to the amygdala volumes. Using a, a novel and advanced segmentation algorithm, we were able to extract the volumes of the amygdala subnuclei, so a total of nine out of the 13 subnuclei of the amygdala. And we were interested in focusing on the main output nucleus, the central nucleus, as well as the basolateral nucleus, which is made up of these three nuclei. And so we examined the data in relation to age. We extracted the volumes, which are shown on the y-axis, and we plotted this in relation to age, and the children underwent two scans. In turn, we found that there was a positive linear association between the volumes of the basal lateral nucleus and age, whereby the children with ASD, the data shown in green, the children had larger volumes relative to the typically developing children at older ages. We subsequently wished to examine these findings in relation to social communication impairments assessed using the autism diagnostic interview, which is shown on the x-axis here. We found overall that children who had larger volumes of the basolateral amygdala in turn had greater social impairments as assessed with the ADIR. So in turn, the findings from this study would indicate that the different nuclei are undergoing variable, variable developmental trajectories and are associated with social impairments. So we subsequently wished to examine in a cross-sectional cohort of children, a larger sample to examine the development of the amygdala in relation to anxiety behaviors. And so for this study, this is a cross-sectional imaging study, which also employed the data from the POND network, as Ryan referred to in his last talk. And as part of the POND network, 
the children were scanned with MRI and we included children scanned between 18, four and 18 years of age and the median age was 11 years. This was a sample of uh, just over 120 children with ASD and just over 60 children who were typically developing. We extracted the volumes of the amygdala subnuclei using the same methods as I described for the previous longitudinal imaging study. The anxiety behaviors were assessed based on parent report using the child behavior checklist. And as part of this cohort, as part of the, the PROND cohort, as mentioned previously in Ryan's talk, is we also had the opportunity to include the data from children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and as well as children who have a diagnosed anxiety disorder, OCD, or obsessive compulsive disorder. So by looking across groups of children with neurodevelopmental disorders, we were able to ask the question whether the development of the amygdala subnuclei would be specifically associated with anxiety behaviors in children with ASD and children with anxiety disorders as reported previously, or whether this was a more of a general finding in terms of the amygdala volumes and anxiety behaviors in general. So a total of 301 children and adolescents were scanned with MRI. We were first interested to examine anxiety behaviors in the children. And on the y-axis is the scores from the CDCL, the anxiety subscales. We found as predicted that children with ASD and children with OCD had significantly higher scores on the CDCL in compared to typically developing children. However, the children with ADHD, there was not a significant difference in terms of their anxiety scores related to typically developing children. We subsequently wished to examine the findings in the amygdala subnuclei. And so we were focusing again on the major input and output nuclei of the amygdala. We found overall for the data for the children with ASD, the data shown in blue, they had significantly larger volumes of both the basal lateral and the central nucleus compared to typically developing children. We subsequently wished to examine these findings in relation to the anxiety scores on the CBCL. And again, we found that both children with ASD and children with OCD who had higher anxiety scores had larger central nuclei volumes. So in summary, these results would indicate that there is a neurobiological association between anxiety behaviors and the development of amygdala subnuclei, these deep brain structures. So the question comes down to why larger amygdala volumes? So why do we see this association? Well, we know from previous research done in animal studies focusing on early stress that this may be so that our animals exposed to stress and anxiety, this may lead to altered processing of stress hormones in the body's, uh, in the body's stress response system, so altered processing of cortisol. And this has been demonstrated in animal work that alterations in stress hormones can lead to the alterations in the cellular signaling in terms of how neurons communicate with one another and can lead to increased growth in the amygdala. So this could be a possible mechanism for why we see larger volumes in, in the children with ASD and the relation with anxiety behaviors. And our future planned work is to conduct longitudinal studies to examine the role of the body stress response system in relation to amygdala volume size in children with ASD and the association with anxiety behaviors. In addition, as part of our ongoing work, we are interested in developing a new atlas of the amygdala using ultra high field MRI. And this is an image of the hippocampus, of the characteristic shape, the seahorse shape of the hippocampus. 
and the amygdala located right in front. So this is a high field MRI. So these, this is the field strength at which the data were acquired for, for the pond study and for the longitudinal imaging study. So we are conducting studies using 9.4 Tesla imaging. And I have a movie here as we scroll down through the brain we can see that using this imaging allows us to resolve the hippocampus and also the subcomponents of the amygdala. And our overall goal is to use ultra high field MRI and complementary immunohistochemistry staining to identify cell types in order to develop a more robust atlas of the amygdala, which we can later apply to our longitudinal studies of children with ASD to examine the association of stress and anxiety behaviors. And well, with that, I would like to thank my collaborators uh, here at Western University and Hospital for Sick Children, as well as the investigators in the PON network. And I'd like to, of course, thank my lab members that made this work possible and the following funding agencies. I'd like to thank the families as well for participating in this research and make this research possible. And I'll thank you, the audience, for your interest, and I'd be happy to take questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. That was great and very clear also, which makes it easily understood by non-neuroanatomists like myself. That was wonderful, actually. Uh, questions or comments for, um, uh, for Emma? So let me... Uh, be asking one question. I mean, that, you know, I, I think the amygdala has been involved or implicated in lots and lots of different things. Uh, and, and I think people have talked about the amygdala and autism for 15, 20 years now or something like that. Uh, with imaging. And it's, do you think that we will ever know what's specific about it uh, in the, uh, the autism? About its abnormalities? Because I, I think you've got some stuff here which suggests that. Yes, yes, Rob, you're right. Uh, so the, I think that the short answer is no, I don't think we will look kind of ever know. But yes, so the amygdala has long been an area of interest uh, in autism. This is one of the key brain regions that was focused on from the early studies in the 90s even. And so there was a large focus on getting post-mortem tissue, specifically focusing on the amygdala and looking at the number of uh, neurons and its overall size. And so this is a, a well-known study uh, done by David Amaral's group in which they had a very large sample uh, across, this was a cross-sectional study, post-mortem study, where they looked at the, the volumes of the amygdala and the neuronal cell count, demonstrating that uh, individuals with autism have a, a decrease in the neuronal number over time and so, uh, so I think there is um, a lot of fascination with this with this brain region. Uh, for you know, for some for this research here, you know, this would be somewhat contradictory to our findings. So I think um, overall, I think someone should do a meta analysis of all the studies of the amygdala to help us to better understand I its role in in ASD. I think that you know, for the, with the efforts of the the PON network, doing genetic studies, behavioral studies, uh, you know, as well as imaging studies, and uh, I know as part of the network uh, as well, there may be uh, also pharmacological studies as well. I think that looking at it from a very broad approach, I think this is going to be able to to offer some some answers. Hey, I, I asked Declan Murphy from the Institute of Psychiatry once why his findings about something were contradictory to those of others. And he looked at me and said, superior science. So perhaps <laughs> that is why uh, uh, your uh, findings are contradictory to, to David's. Well, oh, I mean, it's, I mean, this is post-mortem and our study is imaging. So, you know, it's difficult to, you know, for the, the studies that we're going to conduct with the ultra high field MRI, we're going to do immunohistochemistry where we have access to brain tissue uh, from an autism brain bank as well. So we're going to be able to uh, compare the imaging findings with the immunohistochemistry from individuals with ASD. So we can start to, um, you know, answer some of these questions. 
so I think that there's, you know, a number of, of reasons why, you know, you know, we see so many differences, the differences in the, the severity of the autism phenotypes. There's, of course, you know, methodological issues that could introduce bias into the measurements. So I think it's, um, I think it's complex. It's, it's, it's the spectrum, right? It's um, the, this disorder as well. It's, um, it's not something that we can just study one individual, right? As Ryan mentioned before, you, when you see one person with ASD, it can be one person with ASD, right? Yeah, and, and I think that our ability to quantify the phenotype is not particularly good. Uh, and so it makes it really hard to sort of look at that in, in correlations between imaging findings and clinical findings. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Emma, that was wonderful. Thank you very much for updating us all on that.